Today's video is brought to you by Squarespace. So film is an incredible medium to work with that's you know capable of producing really nice quality and colors, but there's a number of things that can affect the final look of your images in a negative way. And especially when you're first starting out, that can lead to a lot of like misunderstanding and inconsistency with your work. So I uh, wanted to make this video to look at what I think are the top five things that can affect the look of your images shot on film and just share some simple solutions that can help you either avoid those mistakes or fix them and then develop just like a consistent workflow to get the look you're after. So we're gonna start with something that I've spoke about a number of times on this channel before, and that is under and overexposure with film. And to keep things simple, we're gonna focus more on underexposure. I will link to a video below that I did going more in depth about this, uh, but real simple, one of the biggest causes of images that look off is underexposure. And what this will often look like uh, are just film scans or images that you get back that have uh, muddy or flat shadows or kind of muddy contrast throughout. And this is something that can happen even if your image is just underexposed by one stop. So this is something that I think happens quite often when people are first starting out. Say you go and you uh, buy a used 35 mil SLR or a point and shoot with a built-in meter. Well, you know, there's gonna be situations where that meter is thrown off or where it's fooled or maybe it's not working correctly and you're gonna end up underexposing some of your images. And what happens with both uh, black and white and color negative film when you underexpose is there's a lack of density or information on the negative itself because you essentially aren't recording anything in those dark areas. And you can see uh, on this negative here from an exposure test I did, those shadow areas start to become almost see-through. And what happens is when that's scanned, since there's nothing there in those dark areas to scan, that ends up showing up as muddy or kind of washed out areas. And then in contrast to that, when you overexpose color negative or black and white film, you're building up, I guess you could say extra information or extra density in the highlight areas. There's not gonna be a lack of it. And with negative film, even at two, sometimes three stops of overexposure, when you go and scan those images, they can be corrected to look pretty close to the normal image itself. You can see again in this exposure test I did, two and three stops corrected almost fine and looked just about the same as the normal exposure. So the solution to this, eventually your goal should be to learn how to expose as precise as possible. But especially when you're first starting out, knowing that underexposure is gonna give you problems right away and overexposure, you have a little bit of room to play with, you should always kind of err on the side of caution. Give your film a little bit of extra light, maybe that's half a stop, a stop, just to avoid any problems. Okay, so next up is poor film development. And when I first started developing film at home, both black and white in color, one of the things that I learned pretty quick is that there's a number of things that can affect the final look of your images from the developer you use to the temperature to how it's agitated uh, to how old the chemicals are. And for example, when I first started doing color at home, the first few rolls had a pretty strong magenta cast when I scanned them. I'm pretty sure that was due to the temperature being off a little bit. So for the most part, if you go and seek out like a well-reviewed lab that's doing volume daily, there's a good chance they're gonna have a pretty consistent workflow in place that'll be dependable, but there is no set standard where everyone's doing things the same. And with that comes variation in terms of process, equipment, type of chemicals used, monitoring, replenishing, and a number of other things. And what can happen with issues during development is they can lead to contrast and color problems when you go to scan your film afterwards. And even though a lot of that can be corrected with scanning, it still is a pain in the ass at times and it can lead to a lot of extra work for you. So the solution to this, my opinion, is take the time when you're first starting out to look for like a, a recommended lab, somewhere that's well reviewed, that has a lot of positive feedback that people are happy with and send your film there or take the time to try out a few different ones, communicate with them, get to know them just with the goal of finding one place that you can depend on that you know you're gonna send your film to them and you're gonna get back nice, clean, consistent results that are gonna give you the best base to work from. Okay, just have to take a second now to talk about the sponsor of today's video, which is Squarespace. 
So if you've been wanting to build a website for your work, Squarespace is a great platform to do just that. What I've come to love about them is just the ease of use and the quality of templates. You can set up a portfolio in minutes without any previous experience choosing from a wide range of clean and stylish designs that are customizable with endless design options and also just really simple features like clicking and dragging to reorder gallery images, which is something that I absolutely love. You can also set up a shop to sell prints, books, zines, and other things like that. So check out squarespace.com today, sign up for a free trial, test it out, and when you're ready to launch, you can use my link below to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Okay, number three, and something that I've spoke quite a bit about on this channel before, but one of the biggest culprits that can lead to images that just don't look how you imagined or that just look bad, and that is poor film scans. And this applies to scanning at home, you know, from the scanner you have to the software you're using, uh, but also to lab scans. So the reality is, is you could take, you know, one frame of film, send it to 10 different people or 10 different labs, and you're gonna get back 10 images that look different. And that's because there's a number of things that affect the final look from the tool that was used or the scanner that was used to the person who is doing the scanning. And this can lead to a lot of confusion because you might say, shoot your first few rolls of film, send them off, get lab scans back, and maybe they're just really low contrast. That's how they scan their images. You might think that you did something wrong with your exposure, that there was a problem with your camera or the film or something like that. But uh, even beyond that, you might get scans back that look fine, but they don't look anything like what you see online when you see other people working with that specific film. So the solution to this, uh, personally, I think one of the best ways to start bringing consistency and also just getting the most out of your work is to start scanning at home using a good conversion software like Negative Lab Pro. Or if you can't do that, working with a lab that has communication where you can kind of go back and forth and start to let them know your preferences and how you like your images to look as an initial scan. But still, scanning at home, that's kind of my first and foremost recommendation, just because that is a way to really understand the process and start to get the most from your images. So number four is actual issues with the film itself. So for the most part, film is pretty robust and if it's transported and stored correctly, Oftentimes you can use it past its best use state and still get good results. Uh, for example, say you go and buy like a pack of Ilford HP5, you throw it in the freezer and a few years later you pull it out and shoot it, it's a good chance it's gonna look just fine. But there are some situations where improper storage, even during say like transport, can cause issues. So if it's stored at high temperature or high humidity, that can lead to uh, fogging of the film and contrast issues or you know, as it ages can also lead to color shifts and things like that. And I've seen the recommendation of color film being stored uh, below 15 degrees Celsius and black and white below 20. Ilford on their website say that their film should be stored below 20 degrees and that it's important to avoid extreme high temperatures, humidity, or fluctuating temperatures. So when you buy film, let's say you're looking for a deal, you buy it from a private seller, you don't know how it's being transported, you know, is it going through uh, any x-rays or even how is it being stored? Maybe you find some film, say on eBay, from someone in California, Maybe they kept it in their glove box for three months in the middle of summer. You obviously have no idea. So there is some unpredictability that comes with it. So the solution to this, even though this can be a minor one, but I would say when you can seek out your film and buy it from like a trusted seller, preferably in your own country where you know it's been transported and stored properly. For me, that's just one more way to eliminate any potential problems during the entire process. Okay, and the last one, this is a little bit different than the others. This isn't anything to do with, say, like technical issues during the process itself, but this is all about skewed expectations. So I think when you're first starting with film, it's easy to, say, be inspired by other people's work online. Say it was shot on a certain film stock and you really like how their images look, and then you go and shoot with that film and you get your results back and they look nothing like that person's style. And that is because when you're shooting with film, you still have to edit your images afterwards. Everyone's doing it. You build your specific look and sometimes people are editing their images heavily, which there's nothing wrong with, but this is important to keep in mind. And also there are these like buzzwords that are attached to certain films nowadays, Portra being light and airy or soft contrast and soft colors, 
which isn't often the case. These are things that are kind of emphasized afterwards in the editing process. So films still have certain characteristics that differ from one another, yes. But the way I look at it is you choose a specific film for its kind of subtle base characteristics and what it's capable of, knowing that you're going to have to build off of that. So the solution to this is just simply knowing and accepting that regardless of which film you choose to work with, you're still going to have to edit it afterwards, contrast, saturation adjustments, dodging and burning, whatever you wanna to do to get it to that final point. Don't think that just because someone's images look a certain way with one type of film that yours will look the exact same. So just to recap, I think it's important to lock down a solid workflow where you, number one, understand exposure and expose properly. Number two, get your film developed by a professional lab that you feel confident about. Number three, take control of the scanning process or work with a lab with communication. Number four, buy fresh film from a quality shop that's been stored properly. And number five, develop an editing workflow and understanding of how to get the final look that you're after. Okay, so I hope this gives you something to think about, helps you out. And I would say just take the time to understand this, lock down one specific workflow so you can just get on with the actual image making process itself. Um, anyways, that's it for this one. Hope you enjoyed. As always, thank you for watching. I'll talk to you soon.